Hello and welcome to 2024 with the Royals, Rebels, and Romantics. We have so much in store for you. This year, we're well into season four, and I'm thrilled that you're with us. First, I want to give a giant shout out and thank you, heartfelt thanks to all the patrons who are the lifeblood of this podcast and who absolutely make it possible. Thank you so much for your ongoing support. We have lots of fun in store for patrons this year, some new contests, some wonderful prizes, some special content from our fabulous guests. And so if you want to be a patron, please reach out and we'll get you set up. You can join the patron family. So ahead in 2024, some special surprises. Starting next month in February, we are going to publish um, a few, we have one underway ebooks that will be free for the asking. Our first one is published during February in the US. That is the month of Valentine's Day. So the focus will be on romance and love. Now, I know that'll be easy for the romantics, but you know, there are some pretty love driven royals and rebels as well. So we'll have the top 10 royals rebels and romantics and i'd love to hear from you who should be among that crowd i also want to mention we'll be having some tea and talk sessions coming up starting in the spring where we'll arrange some places that we can meet in person we're going to start in the dc area because that's where i am but as i travel i'll be able to do some meetups as well we'll go to tea and talk about some of your favorite royals, rebels, and romantics. So stay tuned for more information on that. Now, exciting news, the Tutors by Numbers, which is a, above me on both sides, is now available on my website. You can reach out to me and I can send you a signed copy dedicated to you or anyone you like. It's not just for Christmas. It's a wonderful gift anytime, especially for you. Now, finally, I do want to thank you so much for listening and watching on YouTube, if that's how you're experiencing us. Please, please leave us a rating if you would. After you listen, it really helps other people find us. So if you would please rate and reach out, I would love to hear from you what you're enjoying, what you would like to hear and see more of, and how you would like to get involved as we keep shaking up history together. Now, another wonderful episode is coming up. Welcome, everyone. I'm so glad you've joined us on Royals, Rebels, and Romantics. I have a very special guest. Amy McElroy is joining us. She has two really wonderful books out about the Tudors. Educating the Tudors is out now. We're going to talk about that. And then, as you see behind her, if you're watching on YouTube, Women's Lives in the Tudor Era is coming out very soon. If you're lucky enough to be in the UK, it's coming out next month in February. In the US, there's a little delay, although not too bad, May in the US. So welcome, Amy, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, we're going to jump right in. And I always like to get a sense of what brought you into history in particular, what appealed to that subject for you, and especially the Tudors. What drew you into that time period? Um, I think... I actually started off, as I'm sure most people do, the, the wives of Henry <laughs> VIII. Um, and I think I, I got interested in those six ladies at first, and then it expanded from there. Um, I actually went backwards first. I went towards, towards the Roses, the Plantagenets. Um, but I think my heart is with the Tudors so I always end up back there although I do still enjoy reading before them as well so yeah right and you can learn a lot about the Tudors by seeing what comes before so that's a really good point thank you now how about education what led you to jump into that area so 
everything that I've read about Henry refers to him as a Renaissance prince. Um, and my first question to myself, well, what does that actually mean? Because when I first thought of the Renaissance, I thought paintings, art, sculptures, all of those kind of things. I never actually thought about the educational side of it. And when I started digging into what Henry's education looked like, it kind of then opened my eyes into what education looked at looked like across the board. So what did everyday people do? Was females different to males? Um, was Henry's different to his siblings and then his children and that kind of thing? So I really fell into it just trying to find out what Renaissance prince meant in reference to Henry VIII, to be honest. <laughs> Well, that's a great way in because he was described that way, sort of as if he stood out even among other royals. Yeah. And and so it's interesting, the education is part of what makes him stand out, but then to look at the whole thing. So I'm going to read a couple of statistics. You know, I'm all into numbers. So I'll read a couple of statistics because I think this is so interesting. When the Tudors first came to the throne with Henry VII in the late 15th century, get this, 1% of women, one, and 5% of men could write. Okay, by the end of the Tudors, so at the end of Elizabeth's reign, as we've just barely bumped in to the 17th century, but really over the 16th century, it increased to 10% of women and 25% of men. Now, before you think, oh, that's still really low, imagine going from 1% to 10%. That's a dramatic increase and 5% to 25%. So tell us about that because that certainly seems to say it's not just Henry and his immediate family. Over the course of the period, generally there's more education. Is that right? Oh, definitely. Yeah, I think um, there's a number of factors, really. Um, one being that the Renaissance was sweeping across Europe at that time. So it was bringing different different aspects of education. Um, in terms of that, there was works being released in English. So a lot of text manuscripts, etc., were originally printed in Latin or scribed in Latin. So the everyday people of England did not understand Latin. So they may go to church and recite their prayers. Realistically, they had no idea what they were actually saying. They were just reciting by memory what they'd been taught, maybe in church or through their family. Um, and they may learn bits so they could follow along with um, church services, things like that. But as work started getting released in English, they might be able to pick things up. But as well as that, a big impact was the increase in the printing presses. Mm -hmm. So the printing presses were increasing. It meant the cost of things were coming down. And whilst your most common people would not be going out to buy books or manuscripts, that kind of thing, they may be able to spend a little bit of money on something like a pamphlet that might have a poem or something like that on, or even a bit of news that had been released somewhere about something and they could start reading from that. And then they could teach themselves if they hadn't been taught to write. So it was all these different things that combined into offering people a greater opportunity to be able to learn to read and write um, now that English was being used. And the church, etc., still used Latin, so it wasn't as if or everything was open to them from that point, but they did then begin to have access to small pamphlets or maybe discarded books, that kind of thing, um, that they could then learn to read from and then maybe write from that. So I think there was a number of factors. There was also an increase in educational establishments, even though there was a dissolution, so which did curb some of the opportunities, but there were a lot of privately founded schools that were predominantly for poor local children. So there was a lot of efforts put in by private individuals to fund education for local children as well. 
That's really interesting because it's like a whole bunch of things sort of come together at the same time. So there's the printing press and also the growth of English and the publication of things in English. So there's opportunity and also a reason to learn to read and to write. And, you know, as that comes, it makes sense for people to start learning. Now, you mentioned the church, and I know that's very important because that was really a center of learning for hundreds of years. And then our friend Henry VIII comes along, and there's the Reformation, this dissolution of the monasteries, which had been a huge source of education. But the Reformation in general changed some things. So can you talk to us about how the Reformation affected education? Yes, like the main thing is what you've just said about the, the closure of the monasteries and the convents as well, because mm-hmm. although they were small in number compared to monasteries and were nowhere near as rich as them, they did provide some educational opportunities for both boys and girls. Um, largely, it was more well-off girls, but the, the opportunity was there. So that being stripped away from them did take away a lot of opportunities those people had to find alternative methods of ed- education whether that was grammar schools which were mostly for boys you may find the odd one that would open the doors to females um but it also meant that everyday people didn't know what they were learning anymore like what to believe that the opinions on religion were changing so constantly that they didn't know what was right and wrong um if they could read and write then they had a better chance of not stepping on a fine line um but obviously those people that still couldn't read and write were relying on the church to deal with their religious vocation all of that kind of thing um their spiritual lives So for them, I think it was a time of upheaval, of not knowing what was right or wrong, how they were meant to worship, things that they weren't allowed, such as relics or certain copies of books, for instance, that may be banned, all kinds of things that they weren't sure from one minute to the next what they were meant to read or write. And I think it did impact education on what what could they read, what couldn't they read, Um, should they be reading in Latin? Should they be reading in English? And I think it was a huge impact. I do think the biggest impact was the dissolution and the opportunities that that took away from people. Um, and I think that's something that is um, not quite discussed as much as it possibly could be when we do talk about the dissolution. I think we generally look at the people that were part of those establishments what happened to them what happened to the money obviously we all know what happened to the money (laughs) but and the lands etc but I think the opportunities for everyday people as well that it took away the opportunities that they had for education that's a really good point because you're right it's more evident or or maybe easier to imagine the money goes and the land goes and it's this huge redistribution of land. But beyond that, there were whole communities who had been relying on those monasteries and convents for their education and caretaking when they were sick and and all of that that also went away. So those those families and those communities were really affected. So even though there was a need to understand, you know, every time a monarch changed, religion changed for a while there in the Tudor period. So what was acceptable to read or should you be reading in Latin or reading in English? Should you read the Bible in English? No, yes, no. So all of that kept changing. And so I think education is an area of the Reformation that we could spend, you know, some time learning more about. And I really appreciate you bringing that up. And helping us understand that. Now, I want to pick up on something else you mentioned, which is that one of the things that could happen in the convents is that girls in a community could be educated as well. So we know that at court, Henry VIII very educated himself and both of his daughters were very well educated. And some of the courtiers 
we're well educated. But as we go out into the countryside, talk to us a little more about the education of girls, because like you say, most grammar schools were not open to girls. If the convents are gone, what do we see with girls and education? Okay, so girls of the aristocracy may still receive some kind of formal education. Mm -hmm. So that might be in terms of their own tutor. So Lady Jane Grey, for instance, had a tutor, was very well educated. The Cook sisters, um, Margaret Moore, like very educated women during the time. But that was largely because of the influence of their parents Mm. outside of them. Girls largely received a more practical education. So that would be things like what they could do at home, how to embroider, um, things like spinning, all different types of things that would keep their household going. So even things like um, apothecary items, so how to make salves, how to make what we'd probably call a potion, that kind of thing to help the health of the family. And you also had midwives. So they were obviously the most skilled women probably of the era, but their education was largely learning from others. So watching childbirth, going through childbirth, learning through imitation of others until they developed that skill to be able to do it on their own um but they were very well skilled and they were very well thought of you also had um women that would open schools themselves so it might be just be a room in their house but it was somebody that had possibly learned to read and write themselves and she was willing to donate either that time or the funds to open her doors to educate other people and it might not just be girls it might be young boys as well and they might learn basic arithmetic basic reading and writing but after that it was largely practical skills so they might practice on a sampler bits of embroidery and then develop their skills from there which meant that they could make the clothing for their household they could make whatever other material items were needed And then as you go up the social scale, it develops into the um, aristocracy making things like altar cloths and beautiful pieces of work that they would then donate or they donate clothing to the less well off, things like that. So it was a skill that all women learned, really, but it was more practical than the formal education that their male counterparts were receiving. That's so interesting. So there are two things I want to pick up on. We're going to pursue the women and sort of go into that. But before we do, you mentioned that Lady Jane Grey, for example, is someone, um, Margaret uh, Moore as well, had a tutor. So it's it's often funny, and I don't know if you ever, probably not over in the UK, but in the US, we will sometimes have the word tutor spelled and tutor misspelled as tutor and all of that. But there were some very fun tutor tutors and um, some really colorful figures in that group. So tell us about some of those who were chosen as tutors for someone like a Lady Jane Grey or um, a daughter of Thomas More, Margaret More, who becomes Margaret Roper, or the royal children. Who are some of those tutors that became um, associated with such famous people? Um, I think the one that stands out for me is probably Giles Jews. So um, he seems to be one of the less known tutors but he actually tutored Henry and all of his siblings and his daughter Mary. So he was obviously very well received at the Royal Court and he was also Henry VIII's librarian. So I think he was held in very high esteem. He taught French, he taught music. Um, So I think he was definitely somebody that I found quite interesting who seems to have kept under the radar. Um, But also... Roger Ascham, for me, I think um, the work that we've got of his still is very insightful. So the things that he mentions about Lady Jane Grey, he mentions the languages that she knows, he mentions the texts that she's studying. And I think it's fascinating because I think partly without him, 
we'd know a lot less about education. But I think a lot of his work also gives insight into how the tutors at the time were creating works of their own to gain patronage from the royal family. So they were dedicating books. Like he wrote a book about archery. So not something I'd probably ever read if it wasn't his and I was interested in what he was doing at the time um but things like that so it was dedicated to a member of the royal family to try and gain patronage which then they could gain positions as tutors possibly amongst the royal family um another one I'd probably say is um John Skelton who tutored Henry VIII um brilliant poet um but have to say comes across as quite arrogant so i do find some of his stuff quite funny to read now and wonder how it was taken years ago so but i do find it quite interesting that definitely some colorful characters and i think it's wonderful how they all seem to have been part of this little circle so i think it's it's basically a humanist circle so the top scholars of the day were all humanists and discussed all their theories and things like that but they all seem interlinked so you can link people like Roger Ascham with John Sheik and then it goes on to Anthony Cook and Anthony Cook's daughters who were very well educated and it's all just one big circle when you look at the tutors but I just find it fascinating. Well, that is really interesting. And so you can see why if you look at um, women like Lady Jane Grey and Mary the First and Elizabeth the First, um, Jane Grey and Elizabeth, for example, shared some tutors and, and you can see how much they gained from them and how it did. You know, Jane Grey came to a very tragic end, but it was certainly she certainly knew her stuff. I mean, she's really remarkable um, sort of wrong place, wrong time, but a remarkable young woman, very well educated, very well spoken and well written when you read what she's writing. And Elizabeth as well, Elizabeth, you know, lived longer and had more time to really become famous about it. But that's really interesting to see the role of tutors in that world and, and in, you know, connection with each other, as well as with these royals who sort of put their um, knowledge on display. So, so that's really great. Now, let's sort of use that to transition into areas in your new book that's coming out very soon and talk about, so we've talked a little bit about the education of women, but let's talk about if your job happens not to be queen or princess, what other kind of work? You mentioned midwives, but what are some of the other kinds of work that women were doing during this period of time? The the biggest employment opportunity for women was service, domestic service. So many, many people had somebody in service within their household. It wasn't just the aristocracy. Um, people may have just one maid, and obviously that poor maid would have a lot of work, whereas as you go up the social scale, the ladies were delegated specific tasks. And I'm not just referring to the royal court where they may have wardrobe keepers and that kind of thing. I mean, in just larger households. So you may have a specific dairy maid. You may have a specific cook, whereas lower down, that one poor maid would carry the world on her shoulders for that family. So domestic service was very, very big back then. That was a huge opportunity and they could take one year contracts they could move around um dairy maids were well sought after and they could gain a lot of good reputational um credit so they could actually work towards higher wages in better households um some did choose to pay younger maids because they thought that they'd get more work out of them but others would choose to go with experience mm. and those with the experience could obviously charge more so there were careers available you also had before the dissolution to go into a convent so religious vocation that was available as well and um, there was other jobs in things like spinning so it allowed women to either work at home with a spinning wheel and they could do what we call piecework. So they would get 
money per piece produced. And then once that was made, they would then give that back to whoever had contracted them and they would earn their money that way. So there were smaller opportunities for things like that, as well as things like baking, pie selling, alewives. So they would... There was all kinds of alewives. For instance, it might just be that you're making your own ale in your kitchen and you make an extra couple of jugs and sell it. But it could be that you turn it into a proper career and you've got, you work in a tavern with your husband and you are the alewife. You're responsible for making all that ale. So your husband is obviously the proprietor and he runs that business. It's not yours, but you will make the ale. You may make food for customers as well. And then one of the more elite roles was the silk women. So the silk women were very esteemed for their skill in working with thread. So they would make the decorations for clothing. So the silk tassels that we see, the very fine um, bits of embroidery that you might see that is then attached to a gown or sleeves, things like that. They were very, very well known for precision and the work that they could do in that and they were almost like their own guild at that time but unfortunately there wasn't a formal guild they weren't allowed to have a guild back then for women but that was the closest you would get to it in terms of they did offer apprenticeships and they would teach young girls how to become a silk woman and then she could go on to do that herself and that trade did reduce a bit as the Tudor era goes on due to the changes in um, merchants coming in with cheaper alternatives, things like that. But it was a very respectable trade and they were paid quite a lot. You can see in things like Henry VIII's accounts that he's paying silk women for tassels and ribbons and buttonholes and all sorts of things that these women were really esteemed for for the amount of detail that they could go into with their thread it's really interesting i love that idea i mean so many ideas you just said about how women would maybe train each other or train their daughters in these careers and also how much we can learn from the accounts you know and what people are paying for and the individuals behind or on the other side of those payments. So we often see what's being paid out by these wealthier people, but there's someone receiving that. And so to imagine the silk woman who's receiving that and taking that home and teaching her daughters or whatever is really a, a wonderful way to think about these women who are making their way. Now, you did mention that um, an ale wife might have a husband who's the proprietor. So let's Let's just look at that that marriage relationship a little bit and look at women in their family lives. So we have these ideas um, that in the Tudor times, everybody got married really young and all of these things that it's a little skewed because there are a couple of famous people who got married really young, but not everybody. So tell us about um, the family life of different different status levels of women or or whatever you want to think about that okay. so if you are very rich or nobility then yes you may get married quite young um not as young as the likes of margaret beaufort so that was mm -hmm. not usual mm -hmm. um it could happen but it wasn't the the common thing to happen um the aristocracy would usually go through what would what they'd call a betrothal so it was more of a promise that when these when this couple is a bit older then yes they'll marry and it was a way to secure peace amongst families secure alliances land boundaries all different types of things titles you name it um it wasn't really about love with that level on the social ladder um, but as we move down they did marry older so you're looking towards mid to late 20s that women would marry and it was because um, they had the opportunity to go into service to move around to save money um, they may meet their intended spouse in the same household and it may be that 
that family was fine with them marrying other families would not be fine and mm. would have to wait for their contract to end and one of them to leave but in the meantime whilst they were working they could save up because they didn't have the rich family to put that fund up for their marriage and their house to move into if they were very lucky and uh, they may be employed by a family who would allow them to marry and would allow them on accommodation as well as a married couple others may get married but have to pretty much stay apart until they were at a point in their lives when they could afford to get some accommodation together but it's down the social scale that you start to see more what we technically call love matches where they've chosen their own partner and they've been able to do that because the family are okay with it they don't have this we need to make an alliance or there might be some aspects of it where they'll say we'd like you to marry within the village kind of thing but usually it's just a case of well we don't have the materials to put any boundaries on your choice of marriage so it is your choice and then women were given the opportunity to then make a sensible choice of somebody that they loved somebody that could uh, provide security for them that they were happy to move around with work that kind of thing and obviously the main goal to be able to find accommodation as a married couple and start a family okay that's that's such a great view of marriage that they can make a sensible choice because they're older and they've gotten to know these people and you get a sense of those marriages probably being on a lot better you know standing so let's move from the marriage to the having children because that's the goal certainly of we know of henry's wives you mentioned you know that certainly was their goal but that really is one of the main goals of marriage at this time. So what was that like for women at different, you know, different places in the class structure, but also in different stages of their lives? If they're getting married a little older, how does that affect their fertility and childbearing and that kind of thing? Yeah, so the higher levels of society that would marry earlier would usually end up having more children um partly because they were married for longer um but partly because they also had access to things like wet nurses so they wouldn't nurse their children themselves they would hand their child over to a wet nurse um i'm not a fan of this theory that Tudor women didn't love their children because they sent them away with uh, wet nurses, all that kind of thing. I don't agree with that at all. I think it was custom and they had other beliefs back then. For instance, they believed that nursing a child would mean that they couldn't um, get pregnant. So for them, their role was to provide more children. So they wanted to be able to get back to their marital bed and provide more children. So that was one aspect of things like wet nurses but they also had opportunity for things like confinement so towards the end of their pregnancy they would lock effectively lock themselves away from the world in dark chambers that would be very warm um kind of meant to resemble the womb for the baby that it'd be very warm it'd be very safe and there they'd be looked after by women women only so it was a no men's own and they would spend that time um resting and preparing for that childbirth and looking at the spiritual life so they would place a lot of um, time on reflection um, prayer things like that if they had the opportunity before the dissolution they may request relics from elsewhere so we know elizabeth of york requested a girdle from um, westminster abbey so things like that would that would they believed would help them provide get through childbirth and provide a healthy child and once the child was born they would stay there and it was it was called lying in at that point so then they would have weeks of rest afterwards to make sure that they were available to basically get back up put their beautiful gowns back on and come back out into the world they would be churched so which was I don't like this word, but it was seen as a term of purification of after the child is born, you're now purified by the church and you can come back into society. Um, but 
lower down the scale. They obviously couldn't just say, right, I'm not going to work for four weeks. I'm going to go and lock myself in a room. They couldn't afford to do that. So they would work right up until they possibly could. They would still be surrounded by women. So it may just be that family members, women of their local village, and they may have aspect, a access to a midwife. There was a lot of midwives around um, in villages. Some may not even charge. They may take a token, and that could be something like a loaf of bread. It was whatever they could afford. So it's not necessarily that they didn't have access to midwives, but they didn't have access to things like locking themselves away for that period of rest or the lying in afterwards. They would be back on their feet as soon as they can, get churched and back to work or back to looking after their children and they may still use wet nurses if needed and obviously we know that there's women that can't breastfeed their, their children so in those cases they would have to find a wet nurse or it may be that they're not producing enough milk so somebody in the village would be found and the church would actually help with things like that so it was kind of like a whole community would rally to help a woman who was going through childbirth. Um, you did, of course, have some that didn't have access to support and would effectively birth a child either on their own or with very few attendants. And then as soon as they could, they were back at work. Um, so it did vary dramatically. I think the the aristocracy obviously had the best opportunities they had access to the best care apothecaries if needed to provide them potions but even lower down the scale um women of the aristocracy if they lived near a village would be called to say we need we need some help with this lady and they would go they would go and help um poorer women around their homes and they would provide things from their still room that they'd created themselves medicines and things like that to help those women so I think it was a whole community thing and I do like to think that women rallied around each other no matter what rank they were that's a really wonderful way to think about that isn't it that rallying and coming to help each other um and and try and involve other people if you don't happen to have this and you need something from the apothecary and go to the manor house and, you know, request that that's, that's a really wonderful thing. And so, you know, even though the aristocracy and the Royals had more on um, the warmth and the collaboration in those villages is also really appealing um, and, and thinking about that. And they may have had, you know, kind of better marriages <laughs> or in some yes. cases, so <laughs> they may have also had um, a, a happier life. So, so we've talked about marriage and we've talked about, you know, childbirth and raising children. So um, I know some women, and of course there were, there were a lot of complications with childbirth and a number of women and children died. But if we imagine a woman who has gone on and had some children, raised some children and her husband dies, what changes for a woman, for different women, when they become a widow? What is that sort of status like during Tudor times? Okay, so again, social scales come in a lot. So a lot of the richer ranks of society would have things like jointures, jointers, dowers, things like that, which meant that a widow was looked after. So that was part of their agreement when they agreed to marry. So, mm -hmm. for instance, if your husband dies before you, mana X, mana Y, mana Z are all yours. They're yours. Um, but obviously, they, that gave them an income. So it meant that they were protected. They had some security. If they were fortunate enough to have the heir of the family, living with them who was still underage then they were even more fortunate because they if they were lucky enough that that child didn't become a ward of the crown they had access to all that as income so and they could use that for, technically to benefit the child but obviously they are bringing that child up so they could use that income to maintain the home educate their child things like that it gave them a bit more freedom so as we move down the down the scales, you see that some widows were quite fortunate, some were left businesses. Um, 
and they were able to trade. Some of the guilds did allow widows to continue trading. They did have stipulations. For instance, if you remarry and it's somebody out of the guild, then they got kicked out kind of thing. Um, but a lot of women were left a business, which to be fair, most of them did then get their sons or whoever to run it for them. But it did give them a bit of financial security. Others were left very unfortunate. So they were left with no property. Um, for instance, their home was not technically theirs. If they couldn't afford to maintain that property, the the church may help them out. So there was parish arms that they could sometimes rely on. But again, it depended on the parish and it depended on the life that the widow then chose to lead. If the church thought that some of her choices were unsavory, for instance, then they could say, no, we are not giving you any financial assistance. Mm. And then she's left to her own devices. Um, but a lot of them would receive some financial benefit from the church. And it might be in terms of food. It might be in terms of money. And obviously she would then have to work. So she may just do spinning depending on the age of her children. Um, she may become a laundress for somebody else. So whatever work she could get to try and maintain her children, um, it just depended. But widows did have a bit more freedom, I feel, than, for instance, your young single woman who was pretty much <laughs> under the control of a male relative was around at that time, whereas I think widows then come into their own. They're, they can make their own choices. They can effectively do what they want to an extent. Um, so I think they did have a bit more freedom, but obviously for some it was disastrous. They didn't have the the ability to be able to maintain their home or provide for their children. Well, that's, that's really interesting. And it, it's always been interesting to me to imagine how a widow could inherit a business. And then in that place the the le the guild would say okay you can continue to run this business as a member of the guild it's just like the one exception for a woman not being in which is quite interesting i think all right this is all i it's just so fascinating to me um as you've thought about women's lives and one of the things that's so interesting is it go you cover so many different parts of society right we we're aware of the queen and the princess and then the aristocracy down to laborers who are you know if you are the household staff of and you're all there is that's a lot to carry on your shoulders so as you think about all this what are a couple of things that you would like listeners and your readers to take away that they might not have realized about women's lives in the Tudor era maybe things that aren't often known about or understood about these women's lives? I think the first thing I would say is how women looked after each other. So in part of my book, I do look at the wills of women. And whilst wills weren't a very common occurrence because if you were married, you couldn't write one without your husband's permission. Um, but then if he did give you permission, it was kind of like, well, what are you expected to write? You kind of had to go with his control. But of the ones that are available, and there are a lot, and it's very, very interesting, I could have read them for years, is how much they actually look after their female relatives. So you'll see things like their gowns are left to their servants or you'll see furniture left to sisters nieces daughters there's even one where that the lady leaves her house but she divides it in such a way that it's just crazy so she says things like the parlor is for my son john and his wife but the upstairs bedroom is for my daughter and and it's it's very very strange but you think what she's done is protected the females in her life. And there's another where she leaves an outbuilding for uh, one of the servants and says, like, that is for her to continue to conduct our business. And I just think it's it's heartwarming to see how they tried to protect women going forwards. And things like the aristocracy would say, um, 
I'd like my servants to be paid a year's wage. And that was to help them whilst they were trying to secure employment. So even Catherine of Aragon asked Henry to make sure that his, her servants were looked after. So I think it, it just, I do find it so heartwarming how much they tried to look after the other females in their lives when at that time, everything was about the male heir and trying to keep that family estate and then you see women going but i want this to go to this female and this to try and make sure they could look after them as much as possible without breaking up that massive family estate that was going to the air so yeah i think that's the first thing and the second one i'd say that you do find the odd woman in places that you wouldn't necessarily think like Henry VIII didn't have females in his kitchen so they were all male cooks etc except for one female confectioner and I found that quite surprising so I thought and it just makes you wonder like what was this woman creating out that was confectionery that Henry VIII obviously must have loved and then you had the royal lawn dresses that I think they were obviously held in great esteem so I think mm -hmm. when you look through the records and the accounts you do find some interesting hints towards women where you might not really expect them to be oh both of those are so great the idea of women taking care of each other is a really powerful message to take away and also the fun of finding a woman she must have made some great sweets for henry the eighth <laughs> to be a special person in his male household so those are both really wonderful things to take away well thank you so much amy this time has flown by and i could just keep talking forever but i really appreciate both of these books so again and i'll have all these links in um the show notes but educating the tutors and also women's lives the Tudor Times um, will be out in February in the UK and in May in the US. Now, in addition to waiting for these, are you working on anything now? And where can we follow you online? I am. So oh. I kind of hinted at it earlier. So my third book is due to be submitted in February. And it is a biography of Mary Tudor, Queen of France. Oh, okay. Uh, that's what I'm finishing off at the moment. And I'm currently researching for my fourth, which is a biography of Desiderius Erasmus. So oh, wow. That's what I'm busy with at the moment. Um, you can find me on most social medias. So um, Twitter or X, whatever it's called now. <laughs> um Instagram, Facebook, um, I'm on all of them. I think it's Amy Mac underscore books on Twitter and Amy McElroy on Instagram and Facebook. And then um, I'm also on Blue Sky and Threads. And I've got a blog as well, which is just my name, dot blog. So okay. all of those. Well, we'll include all of those, but that's great. So we can... Um follow. So we've got two things to look forward to coming up. Mary Tudor, Queen of France. And you and I've talked a little bit about this. She tends to be a bit overlooked, I think, because we go to Mary Tudor, who becomes Queen of England, who yes. also gets a little overlooked. So the Mary Tudors, I'm really glad to see. But the Queen of France, she had a fascinating life. So that's great. And of course, Erasmus um, made such a difference in the Tudor court, really made his mark. And um, so that I cannot wait. Very, very exciting to hear about both of those. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing all this exciting information about the education and, you know, this deep dive into the women's lives. I think it's just been wonderful. I really appreciate it. Well, no, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure to chat to you. Well, thank you. And thank you everyone for listening. It's a great way to begin our new year together. So thank you for joining me and stay tuned and we will keep shaking up history together. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Royals, Rebels and Romantics. I hope to hear from you soon and I hope you'll join us again as we keep shaking up history together. Thank you. Thank you.